So Duncan, thank you for your time. It's going to be great to hear how your career's progressed and especially from yourself. I believe you've got some patents to your name and a few various things that you've been working on over the years while you've been at VMware. So I think people are going to take a lot from this session. So as a starting point, can you introduce yourself and tell everyone who you are and what you do? Sure, my pleasure. And thanks for having me, by the way. It's, uh, it's always great to be on these types of uh, sessions slash conversations. It's uh, very enjoyable. Uh, well, as you've already mentioned, my name is uh, Duncan Epping. I currently work as a chief technologist for uh, VMware in the office of CTO in the, uh, the cloud uh, platform business unit. Um, the business unit is actually something that has changed, I believe, three times in the past 18 months. So I used to be part of the storage and availability business unit. Then it became the uh, HCI business unit because we merged together with the uh, VMware Cloud Foundation team. And now recently they, they merged the HCI business unit together with the Cloud Platform business unit uh, because a lot of the components that are part of uh, VMware Cloud Foundation um, belong to that business unit. So they decided to collapse those business units. So now I'm part of the Office of CTO in that uh, particular business uh, unit. And that also means for me that my role kind of expanded um, the last few weeks. So originally I was primarily focused on vSAN. I mean, I should probably say storage and availability, but for most of us, that basically means we end up talking about vSAN because that was one of our core products. Uh, but now that also is starting to include everything else that is part of the business unit. So as you can imagine, vSphere is a major part of that. So uh, for instance, vSphere from an evangelism perspective uh, ended up on my plate. And then for instance, all the Tanzu stuff is uh, something that you know my, my colleague Cormac Hogan takes care of because he's primarily focusing on the cloud native aspects. Perfect. And I think there's a, a plenty of announcements at VMworld a few weeks back right around the whole democratization of AI, the whole smart NIC integration stuff and the various other things that are coming out. I think there's a lot of cool technology that can enable people to, to propel themselves forward in the future. I think it's gonna be interesting to see what comes out over the next six months from VMware. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, there, there are, there were a lot of cool, um, you know, tech previews slash announcements at, at VMworld, and indeed, SmartNix definitely one of them. It's also one of the things that ended up on my, uh, on my on my plate. But that is something that is primarily a cross business unit effort, as you can imagine, right? The networking business unit, and then the cloud platform business unit, and then there are some other players in there as well. So it's uh, that's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think um, I, I'm really excited to see what happens in in well, Q1 is in, fan, in, in, in calendar year, Q1 next year, to see what comes out from that perspective and what becomes actually available for us to start tinkering with a little bit. It's going to be really good fun. So if you think about your career, right? So wh where did you start out and how's that journey, how, how's, that, how's that journey been for you? Sure, yeah, I mean, um, well, let, let's start all the way at the beginning, right? I started playing with computers when I was, I don't know, eight, nine, something like that, probably, maybe maybe 10, I'm not, I'm not even sure anymore. Uh, my, my dad bought me uh, my first computer probably for either my birthday or, you know, Santa Claus or whatever, it, it, Christmas, whatever it, it was. I'm not sure. It was an MSX, so a, a Philips MSX1. And, you know, back then, as, as, you, as you probably know, you had to buy a magazine to start typing basic so you could play games. Yep. There were some games available, but there wasn't too much out there. So that was what kept me busy. And, you know, I had a lot of interest in, 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 in that space, but for a, whatever reason, I next not really gravitated towards uh, moving in that direction. When it came to uh, school, I was more focused or I was looking towards going to uh, uh, the, uh, the Fokker school and Fokker is a, uh, an aircraft builder in the Netherlands. So I was planning on doing that, uh, but right around that time, uh, they were about to go bankrupt. And that was the point in time where I decided, you know, probably not the best career plan. You may want to rethink this. Yeah. So, you know, I was already doing a lot with computers and, you know, I had an MSX1, I had an MSX2, I owned a, a Commodore 64, uh, all that stuff. So I figured, you know, the computer stuff may be interesting. And uh, you know, I had a friend that also owned a, a 286. And we spent a massive amount of time trying to figure out how to get stuff up and running. So, you know, that was something that also, had my interest, so I decided to, uh, for uh, from a school perspective, going towards uh, that direction. Uh, my primary focus back then was, you know, sys admin, and then I did some classes around, you know, computer de uh, 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 product development, uh, primarily, you know, learning the basics of coding. Yeah. 
uh, quickly found out that although I was capable of developing software, it wasn't my thing. Um, it wasn't something that I enjoyed doing. I really like tinkering with stuff, installing, configuring, trying to figure out why it does work, why it doesn't work. You know, back then you were building your own computers and servers as well. So I uh, basically moved into uh, into that space and started out as a sysadmin uh, working for a, um, a consultancy company. And yeah, I ended up working, working for various uh, companies, uh, you know, from smaller organizations to lar larger organizations. And I ended up doing a project at Oracle, uh, basically imaging, I don't know, 800 new laptops or something like that. Yeah. And after doing that, that project, um, they asked me if I wanted to join uh, Oracle as a sysadmin. So I ended up joining Oracle as a sysadmin and started, uh, you know, besides doing all of the desktop management, also starting to look at the, uh, the Windows servers. Then uh, from Windows server management, I started looking into uh, Unix management and kind of expanded my scope. And the funny thing is that um, I was talking to someone about that a while ago, and uh, we actually, at that point in time, uh, had some challenges with our support engineers that were also Oracle guys, of course, because they had, they had to be capable of running multiple operating systems on a single machine, which was impossible back in the day, right? It, the, the, you simply had to have multiple images in physically installed on separate disks and switch around using your BIOS. But you know that wasn't really a workable solution for the majority of those guys. So around that time, this new solution came out, which in hindsight was you know the very first version of VMware, which we ended up doing a proof of concept with uh, at Oracle. I completely forgot about that, right? It's something that I only realized like, you know, like, I don't know, 10 years later or whatever it was when I started moving into the virtualization space, I realized that I'd already seen the name at some point in time. That was, you know, 10 years be before or whatever it ended up being. Um, well, anyway, I was working for Oracle as a, uh, as a, um, a sysadmin. And then you know, there was a couple other companies that joined after that also as a sales admin, nothing too spectacular, focused on various things ranging from Windows to you know, Lotus Domino and, and what have you. And then at some point in time, I actually uh, ended up moving to the other side of the country. So I used to live in the, uh, the center of the Netherlands. And then I moved down south. And when I moved down south, I started looking for a new role, I ended up working for an insurance company. And that insurance company, that's about 15 years ago, probably, uh, that insurance company had all of the traditional problems that people would have that would start looking at virtualization, right? Challenges with cooling, challenges with power, not enough space in the data center, all of the basic stuff uh, that, that people are running into, you know, 15 uh, years ago or so. So we started back then, uh, I think like it was probably like version 2.0 or version 2.5, something around that time frame. And we started looking at this, this thing that, you know, uh, started popping up everywhere in the market called virtualization by VMware. And uh, we actually ended up implementing 2.5 in our environment, uh, ended up buying a bunch of blade servers, uh, connected it to a uh, Dell EMC or back then EMC Clarion. CX4. Yeah, exactly. And actually it did, um, it did quite well. It's, uh, it was a very, you know, interesting solution that that worked really well for us. It solved a lot of challenges, and we used to have a lot of problems. We literally had to uh, uh, completely power off the data center uh, twice uh, because of uh, cooling issues. Uh, we we were hitting, uh, I don't know, it was like 45, 42 degrees outside in a very warm summer in the Netherlands. It doesn't happen too often, but as a result, it ended up being extremely hot inside the data center as well, had the power of the data center. So that's what triggered the uh, the whole virtualization project. And I basically fell in love with virtualization. So um, I really enjoyed doing that. And I decided to uh, to move back into consultancy again because I just simply wanted to get, you know, more experience with virtualization, seeing different environments out there. And I joined this uh, smaller consultancy company in the Netherlands. And I worked there for about a year and a half, two years. I'd done, I don't know, probably 30 different projects. Uh, we were do, basically doing, you know, a new project every other week, uh, deploying, you know, uh, VMware 2.5 for the first uh, releases and then 3.0 when it came out. It was nuts. I mean, the whole world wanted to run, you know, on, on the VMware. So, 
Um, around the same time, I still also started blogging, and then um, that got picked up by a few folks at VMware. Uh, they were looking for uh, new consultants, so they reached out to me, asked me if I had a uh, if I had interest in joining VMware. Uh, funny enough, at the same time, I received an email from this guy called Chad Sackage from EMC, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to join EMC as the uh, the first V specialist in Europe. So I had a decision to make. Um, it was a tough decision, but in the end, I decided to go to uh, VMware mainly because, first of all, well, you're extremely close to the fire, right? You get to work for the company that develops the, the product. Uh, secondly, um, with Dell EMC or with EMC back then, I would have been the first guy in Europe focusing on VMware, yeah. which would have meant probably 90, 95% travel, right? And I had a fairly young family, so uh, that's not something I, I wanted to do. And I ended up joining VMware, which also meant I had to do, I don't know, 60, 65% of travel, still crazy, but at least it was 30% less, right? It's uh, and, and that's how I ended up joining VMware. I joined VMware as a, uh, as a senior consultant, uh, probably one of the, uh, and uh, I mean, senior consultants, so, senior consultant sounds senior, right? But I was the junior guy on the team and I was probably, you know, one of the most junior members in the, uh, the PSO team uh, back then because there were guys already working there for like, I don't know, three, four, five years, maybe even. So I was one of the, uh, the young ones on that, that, that team. But um, yeah, since then I've, yeah, well, as you, Probably know I, I made a, a couple of changes within the organization. I've moved from consultancy uh, into this global cloud practice where we deployed the first uh, VM cloud director uh, deployments uh, throughout the world. So I did the one in Europe, I did the one for Colt uh, back then, but my colleagues uh, did them in the US for the larger service providers. And then after that, I ended up joining uh, the technical marketing team. And um, I was uh, within the technical marketing team. I started out as being responsible for uh, basically HA. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that, that scope expanded from HA to HA plus storage. Uh, then I became responsible for uh, the SDDC. Um, I managed to uh, convince some other people to join the company uh, around the same time frame because, of course, we needed to have people you know, focusing on, on other areas as well. So I uh, persuaded people like William Lamb to join the team. Uh, Alan Renouf, uh, Frank Deneman, uh, Cormac was already part of VMware, uh, but he wasn't part of the tech marketing team. So I asked him if he wanted to join the tech marketing team, which was, you know, we had a fantastic team around that, that, that time. It's probably one of the best teams I've ever worked with, to be honest. And then uh, after that, um, I moved from um, the, um, the technical marketing team to something that they called integration engineering. My manager that was part of the tech marketing team uh, decided to start a new team called Integration Engineering, which was basically customer zero for VMware product. So we would be the first team that would actually start deploying and testing uh, newer VMware products before they actually go out to market, right? So not even the beta, but before the beta would be released and try to figure out what all of the operational uh, caveats are, but potentially also just the regular bugs. So we would be doing all those types of uh, uh, testing. And um, after that, actually, as part of the same team, we had a separate project, uh, which was trying to build a hyper-converged appliance solution, mm -hmm. which was called uh, internally Project Marvin, externally known as Evo Rail, now known as VX Rail. And I was, part, I was the, the, uh, the, the architect, the first architect on that team. So there were three of us that started that, that project. Um, for VMware itself, I must say it wasn't a huge success, unfortunately. I mean, the plan was to conquer the whole world, have different vendors selling that same platform. Uh, what we found out that, you know, our scope was way too big. And um, when we started working closer with Dell and Dell started working closer with us, that's when we started noticing a lot of traction. And as, as you know, it's, a, you know, it's a, you know, multi-billion dollar uh, market right now for, for for not only Dell but just in general right so it's a, it's a, it's a huge a huge market. Um, after that, I ended up joining the uh, the office of CTO and um, I joined the general office of CTO first, so the corporate office of CTO. And from the corporate office of CTO, I moved into the uh, storage and availability uh, space, and that's basically where I'm uh, still at at the moment. So. 
a lot of different steps, uh, not only within the organization, within VMware, but also before I joined VMware. Yeah, definitely. It's very interesting. I think um, the whole idea, I would take the whole Evo rail thing, right? And trying to come up with an idea and a concept and an architecture that would be, if we, if we roll back to before that came live, um, everybody was looking for this hyper-converged storage solution, right? And there was a race to the market from the likes of yourselves, Nutanix and uh, SimpliVity and whoever else, right? Trying to do something very similar, um, but then everyone finding the little bugs along the way and everyone trying to come up with that software defined model of it so that they could try and let everyone sell it, but then make their own money on it. And I think that's where a lot of people start to fall over because as we're well aware, right? Doing even just taking vSAN and putting it on ready nodes or on a OEM provider's piece of kit, the hardware compatibility list, management of firmware and drivers and all that kind of stuff is quite painful. And that's now where the likes of the X-Rail and, and, and those off the shelf products now really fix that issue for people. Don't be wrong, right? But the whole new lifecycle management functionality in vSphere 7, it, it's got a lot easier. Um, but if we go back to Evo Rail days and things like that, that was, that was probably the biggest pain point for people, I think. Yeah, I mean, and that's definitely one of the reasons uh, we had a lot of challenges uh, as well. The lifecycle management aspect, as you mentioned, is just, it's just difficult uh, when you're working with four or five different vendors that have five, six different models. You know, potentially those models have different disk controllers. So you're talking about, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 different variations. It just makes it very difficult to create a, a single framework that caters for all of those different models. Yeah. Of course, it's, it's doable, but you need to have a large engineering team backing that. And the Evo Rail team that we had was a fairly small, agile team that just wanted to move as fast as possible. And we could only move extremely fast and get to market extremely fast when we focused on a, on a single vendor. So, to, you know, working with Dell, when you're part of the Dell family is, of course, you know, the easiest, easiest route to pick. There were some other vendors that we work with, well, well with, by the way. So, for instance, we did a lot of work with Fujitsu Simmons. Mm -hmm. Um, that was a, a great company uh, to work with, very easy to work with as well, extremely eager. And uh, I have to say it's, you know, Fujitsu Siemens is one of those unique companies because they have that Japanese plus German background, right? And when it comes to the engineering aspect of things, you know, the build quality, you know, just the, the, the whole, the, the way they, they work, all the processes they put in place and what have you, it, they are extremely thorough when it comes to you know, developing a, a product that those guys are an excellent team to work with. Yeah. That's, that's something that, um, you know, I learned a lot from that experience. Yeah. And I think having those processes lined up so you know what route you're following rather than trying to navigate potentially the HP world or Lenovo world or IBM world or whatever it might be is it's probably not quite as simple in some circumstances. Um, so what does a, what does a life in a day of Duncan look like now? So as part of the office of the CTO, what, what's your day in a life look like? Sure. Yeah. It's, um, well, we do a lot of different things, right? In the office of CTO, we actually uh, recently um, hired a new CTO for our, our business unit. Well, recently, it's probably already four or five months ago. But um, so we had to figure out as well for ourselves, you know, what is it that we want to focus on going forward? So it's a discussion that we've had uh, recently. And a couple of things. If you look at the office of CTO, just explain what, what we are responsible for. Uh, there are a couple of things that the office of CTO typically uh, uh, does within VMware. Um, first of all, there's the, the strategy and vision. So defining uh, the strategy and vision for the BU and the products and the features. Mm -hmm. um, but also evangelizing uh, that, not just amongst customers, having the conversations with different customers, but also at events. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on top of that, there's also, you know, an aspect of trying to figure out ourselves uh, where the industry is heading towards and trying to figure out if our roadmap, our vision, our strategy actually aligns with what the industry is doing and what customers are looking for. Because in some cases you see things happening within the industry that you know may not necessarily align with our roadmap, which means that we, are, we need to do some redirection or at least have a conversation in terms of, you know, is this something that fits within our you know, portfolio profile as well, right? There are many different things happening within the industry right now. You see a lot of people talking about blockchain, uh, for instance. And of course we have some blockchain efforts within the company, but not necessarily within our business units, business unit, because it doesn't really prof fit the profile of our, of, of our BU. So if you look at it from a uh, office of the CTO perspective, uh, strategy and vision, 
And then there's the evangelism uh, aspect. And we still do some customer zero efforts. So we try to stay hands-on with the products, try to figure out what works, what doesn't work. And especially with the newer features that what we uh, tend to figure on. Because if you look at uh, the amount of releases that we have and the amount of work that for instance, the tech technical marketing team has to do just to maintain all the material that they have out there. A lot of the work that we do is trying to figure out, okay, how does this work? What can our customers do with it? Have those early conversations with customers to try to figure out what their use case will, de will be, provide that feedback to uh, technical marketing, provide the feedback to product management, to product marketing, so they can you know, make it part of our messaging. So it's, it's kind of a mix of, of, of things. Uh, on top of that, we also have what we call an advanced uh, development team. And the advanced development team typically has very specific projects. You can imagine that, for instance, Project Monterey, the SmartNIC effort, um, a large portion of that effort, of course, is all around the network components. Uh, what kind of network services can we offload to that SmartNIC? But as you can imagine, it should also be possible to offload some of the storage services to that SmartNIC. At VMworld, we did a couple of uh, uh, previews around that. So for instance, we've shown at VMworld how a physical machine could potentially mount a, a vSAN uh, or part of a vSAN data store, an, ob an object on one of the vSAN data stores. Well, that is something that the uh, um, advanced development team, for instance, prototyped. And that is the team that, well, that, that team is part of the office of CTO as well. My focus is not on the development side of things. So my focus is primarily on uh, the strategy and then the evangelism uh, side of things. And of course, I also do a lot of the hands-on uh, work. So the evangelism things, um, just so people have an understanding that could be presenting at VMworld in front of you know, 1,500, 2,000 people. Uh, it could be another industry event, but it could also be a local VMUG in Austria with 50 people, right? So for us, it doesn't really matter. You know, We basically show up anywhere where people request us and where it makes sense. So. If it from a you know budget perspective works, then we end up showing up and present you know our stuff to the world. Yeah, it's about getting that, that awareness out there into the community to make sure that they know what's coming and what they can maybe use themselves and, and evangelize themselves then into the customers even further, right? Or into their own organizations. It then takes some of the workload off you guys a little bit as well. Yeah, and the, the difficult thing with, with this is the following. And this is something, you know, it's a discussion I've had internally as well, uh, because what we do is very difficult to measure. And I've explained it, this to a lot of uh, tech marketing managers and product marketing managers and directors and all the way up to the VPs, right? You know, what is it that you do? I said, you need to look at that like this. We are planting the seeds. It's like, what do you mean? I said, well, when an SE goes in right, and he starts talking about vSAN and the customer has never ever heard about vSAN before, uh, they typically look at him like, there's another guy trying to sell me something, right? they won't be as interested if, if you know, it's, just, it's like a cold, a cold call, right? So what we end up doing is we go to a lot of these events, try to explain to customers, to technical people, what the product is, what it does, how it works, and what is coming in the future, what you can expect from it. And I'm not even trying to sell people in it, right? If people ask me, what will it cost? I don't even know what the licensing structure looks like. I don't, well, I more or less have an ID, but you know, I'm not the sales guy. I don't, I mean, in the end, I don't get paid more or less whether you buy or don't buy the product. What I would prefer people to be is a happy VMware customer, whether they use vSAN, vVols, you know, whether they use vSphere plus Tanzu or use a different uh, platform, right? As long as they are a happy customer. Of course, I prefer them to use our products than, you know, our competitors' products. But, you know, as long as they are happy, they are happy. They need to someone make sure that they meet the requirements. And that is basically what we do. We end up basically talking about technology, planting those seeds. And then at some point in time, if one of those SEs comes along and says, you know what, we have this really cool thing. It may be something that you could be interested in. Like, oh, okay, but that, that is the thing that Duncan or Cormac or Frank or whatever it is spoke about at, at one of those VMUGs or at VMworld. And that actually looked cool. You know, can you show me again what it looked like? So that is basically what we end up doing. And that, as I mentioned, the challenging thing is that because we are planting seeds, it's very difficult to measure what the outcome is of planting those those so those seeds. I'm I'm pretty confident that without planting those seeds, sales would be lower. But you can't quantify it. It's it, it that is very very difficult. And that's a lot with a lot of marketing things, right? Is that you can do a lot to to kind of track, trace, and understand what people are 
clicking through and all that and what the engagement looks like and things but when it's verbal engagement and actually attending events and things like that, yes people turn up but you can very rarely follow that through to the end outcome of a procurement yeah. it's it's yet that person's turned up and he's listened to duncan talk about visa and everything else and then not heard from him or her for 12 months and then all of a sudden they've gone out and spent a fortune on 20 30 40 vx rail nodes <laughs> so it's yeah like, it's and that actually does happen. And we do get some feedback from uh, from the sales folks. So uh, every once in a while, you know, someone from sales or pre-sales uh, reaches out to us and said, you know what, this customer actually saw your presentation at the VMAG in Denmark or the VMAG in Italy or whatever it ended up being. And they bought, you know, 500 licenses or, you know, you met this customer at, uh, I've met customers, I don't know how many customers at VMworld <laughs> have so, had so many meetings and every once in a while, you know, one of the sales guys looks back to us and say, you know what, you had that meeting with them, they really appreciate it, they thought you were very open and honest, you told them what works and what doesn't work, and as a result, they actually, actually ended up buying that solution. Mm -hmm. And that is the, I think the great thing about being part of an organization like this is because we don't have a sales quota we can be really honest with the customer. Sometimes the sold salespeople don't appreciate it because sometimes also I have to tell a customer, you know what? Not right That's there. not actually a great use case for the solution for these particular reasons, right? You have a very specific uh, workload. Like I, I recently had a customer that wanted to store, I don't know, 60, 70 petabytes worth of uh, data on top of vSAN. And I said, you know what, vSAN can do that. What are we talking about? How many VMs and what have you? And he said, well, it's actually a single VM. Like, what do you mean? I said, well, from a compute perspective, it's just a single VM, four vCPUs, I don't know, 64 gigs worth of memory. I have two hosts and that's it. So, okay, what is it storing? Well, it's storing imaging data. So what are you storing it on right now? Well, I actually have this very specific NAS solution that was designed for imaging data or what have you. But, you know, people told me that vSAN may also be an option. I said, well, you know, in this case, you may as well use the system that you have because it's very specific you know, it's, it's, it's purpose built for what you are doing, right? There's nothing going to beat that solution uh, at, at, this, at this point in time. So, and but that's the cool thing about being in my position. I can just be honest about it. And the customers appreciate that as well. As well. I think there's a lot of times, right, where a customer will come to us and, and ask us a question and you can sit there going, I can see where they're coming from and it may actually work that way, but there's four or five other ways of doing it more cost-effectively and meet those requirements. And that, that's from my, being on the reseller side of the fence, right? And I don't get paid commission. I don't get paid more or less for selling someone something either. And I'm not a salesperson. I'm a technical person as well. So from my point of view, it's, I, see, I see us as the check and the balance. So going in and saying, yeah, the sales guy's got this opportunity and they've heard about vSound or whatever it might be. And then we can go in there and actually qualify it out technically and then say, well, actually, it will work. But there's other options that might make it cheaper. What is what is the driving factor? Do you want standardized? Because it might be you're standardizing on vSAN everywhere, right? And then at that point, there's an argument to say yep. it's one, one kind of route into market. But if it's all about cost, which a lot of the times people always bring that up as a conversation, um, it might not be the right route. So if we, if we think about um, where you are today, right? What... what I'm going to say finish line, but what's your aspirations? What is it you'd like to get to doing in your career before you retire? Well, hopefully I'll retire soon. <laughs> Not that that is going to happen, or by, by, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, it, it, it's a difficult question. It's something that I've thought about as well. Uh, so far, you know, I've moved around uh, pretty organically. So it always just, just, well, I wouldn't say it just happened, but, you know, there were always opportunities somehow out there that I, you know, managed to walk into or manage the spot. And um, I've never really planned out my, my career either. And it, it's funny because I always tell people, you know, the same thing, you know, think about where you want to be in three years, think about where you want to be in five years. But the challenge, of course, also is that if you start as a senior consultant or you start as a consultant, whatever it is, working for a larger technical organization, and you know there's about four or five levels still you know, above where you are right now, you can start planning for that. Uh, the challenge for people like myself is that when you reach um, a level like chief technologist, well, there's only one level higher than that, which is being a CTO. Now, 
you need to be realistic uh, as well at, at that point in time, right? Of course, you can become a CTO working for VMware for a business unit or maybe even a corporate CTO. Uh, but that also typically means that you will need to move to the US mm. um, or potentially, you know, start a new business, you know, be part of a new business unit or whatever it is. And that is, well, first of all, I have no interest in, in, in moving to the US whatsoever. That is <laughs> something I can be uh, open and honest about and, and, and not because of, 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 the, of the country itself, but primarily because I have a family mm -hmm. and we basically love where we live today in the Netherlands. It's a great, you know, great, great country to live. Um, all of our friends and family live here, so no interest in, in, in moving. And then the other option would be, you know, starting this new BU slash being part of this new product family or whatever it ends up being. Those, you know, those things will only pass by once every 20 years, at a, once every 10 years, right? So chances of you being the person actually being able to, you know, jump into that position are, are, are pretty slim. Yeah. And I think that's the thing where right? it's being realistic with yourself. And I think... We had this conversation on a couple of sessions where people look at a job title and aim for a job title without really fully understanding what that job actually entails. And they might be striving to do something that they're not interested in. It might be that they want to be really hands-on with tech, right? No offense, but a CTO at a higher level than yourself is probably not going to be as hands-on with tech as maybe you no. are. No, I mean, that's a conversation I've had with our CTO multiple times. Uh, he joined not too long ago. Like four or five months, but I'm pretty sure that he hasn't been able to install configure vSAND just to figure out, you know, how it actually works, uh, what it looks like. And that that is a problem in, in in general. The the other thing, of course, is as well, um, if you look at, you know, the average CTO, people like, you know, the field CTOs, for instance, that we have in our organization, people like Joe Bagley, uh, Chris Wolf. I mean, the work that Joe does is really cool. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people would love to do the work. The problem is not too many people would like to make the sacrifices he makes in terms of family life, you know, just the, the social aspect of, 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 of things. I, I've had many conversations with Joe, and if you look at the, the amount of travel that he does, although I would love to be in his position, I wouldn't want to do the amount of travel that he does. And my travel is already, the amount of travel that I do is, is, is quite substantial, right? But his is almost, I wouldn't say twice as much, but it's probably close to that. Yeah. So, it's, it, it is something that you need to think about as well. The other thing, of course, that I think everyone at some point need to think about is um, if you work for a company and you get to a certain level, you're either happy of, uh, you know, of being at that, that, that level and you know, potentially you can grow from a salary point of view or whatever it ends up being and have some form of personal growth or you need to reconsider if you still want to work for the company and potentially move outside of the company. Now, that is also a, a challenge because if you work for one of the market leaders in the space, you work for VMware, you work for, for Google, you work for, for Amazon, for Microsoft, whatever it ends up being, you know, which direction do you go into? Do you go to one of the other bigger players or do you make a decision to move to one of the startups? And do you want to take the risk of moving to a startup as well? Because, you know, although it sounds great and there's always a huge opportunity it also comes at a cost and there's a significant risk associated with it because not every startup is a hit. Well, actually probably, you know, 90, 95 out of 100, 100 startups are not a hit. So they, they don't hit the stock market. They don't, you know, they, they don't, uh, they don't get bought up for a significant, a significant amount of money. And all you end up with is, is a t-shirt instead of that, you know, that fancy car or the big house that you wanted to buy from the stocks that they originally granted you. So coffee <laughs> yeah, exactly so there are many things to, to 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 think about and personally if i look at you know a company like vmware uh, we've made a lot of changes from a strategic perspective over the past 12 years when i started out it was just a virtualization company mm -hmm. right and after i joined uh, uh, paul moritz became the ceo and the focus was more towards cloud and um, after that, of course, Pat Gelsinger joined and he, we started looking at things like, you know, a software-defined data center besides doing compute and having this abstraction layer from a consumption perspective for compute. We may also want to do something in the networking space. So we ended up buying an Acera and we started looking into uh, storage virtualization with vSAN and with vVols. 
And then on top of that, we also started, look, well, we also included, you know, things like V Realize Automation, V Ops, and all of the other tool sets, all the, all the other different tools that we have. And if you look at the industry right now, I don't really see, you know, a better place to be at. And considering the position that I have within the company, mm -hmm. my focus primarily now is on personal growth, you know, trying to, you know, get better at what I do. Mm -hmm. rather than trying to climb up a, uh, a, a ladder because that is just very difficult at this point in time. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And if we think about your, your career today, what's the most memorable moment so far? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, um, it is something that um, I was actually thinking about not too long ago. And it, it's funny because um, I've already mentioned Evo Real. I think that was... I mean, that was an awesome experience. Um, just purely from a work perspective, because it was truly unique, right? We were literally a startup within the company. We had our own funding um, for marketing and, 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 and all, of the, all of that stuff, just like a startup would work. They, they, they literally, literally gave us you know, a bucket worth of money and say, here you go, start developing the product, try to figure out what the market looked like, market it, go to market, start selling it. So we went through that, that whole, whole motion from, from all the way from, you know, not having anything to starting to write the code, you know, start coming up with the UI, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to get everything installed and configured within a reasonable amount of time, you know, and that, that was a great experience. And that is something that I, I truly uh, enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. But besides work, the one great thing, which, um, one of the things that I probably enjoy most about working for a company like uh, VMware, it's not just the work aspect of things, but also the cultural aspect. Uh, there are a couple of things that VMware does extremely well um, when it comes to giving back to, to society. Um, there are a couple of different efforts happening uh, within uh, the company. I was fortunate enough to be able to go on what they call um, a, a good gigs uh, track, uh, basically, um, I was one of the folks on the team of people that went to Vietnam and we started creating these um, uh, classroom setups for uh, different orphanages in, in, in Vietnam. That was probably one of the craziest experiences in, in my life, both from a work perspective, uh, but also from a personal point of view, because you get to, you know, sit down with these six, seven, eight year old, old, old kids who literally have nothing, right? They have a pair of shoes, a t-shirt, and that's it. it. They're extremely, extremely poor. And just seeing how happy these kids were going into, you know, not even school, right? They came out of school, went back to the orphanage, and then they have to go into a new class. They're just, you know, there's a new, a new experience for them. They were so excited that they get to sit behind the computer and trying to figure out what it does, how it works, and what have you. That was that was extremely cool, and. Uh, one of the other thing I also want to mention, uh, because that was also truly unique, I organized the first VMworld run. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you were at VMworld back yeah. then, but it's, it's, I don't know, it's maybe eight years, seven, eight years ago. And that is something that also happened organically. Um, I asked around on, on Twitter if anyone wanted to do a morning, early morning run during VMworld, you know, two or three people reached out. They wanted to join, then four or five more wanted to join. Then, you know, all of a sudden it was a group of 20. And I said, you know what, maybe we could do like this VMworld run. Maybe we could do like a 5K run and, you know, see what comes out of it. And we started out with, uh, you know, 20 people saying, yeah, sure. And then we started advertising it. And all of a sudden we had like 200 <laughs> something people that ended up joining us. Um, of course, I never realized it was going to be 200 something people. So besides trying to figure out where we would have these 200 people running in San Francisco, which is not easy because you need to have a place that is actually safe for 200 people to run. Um, I also needed to figure out how to get people from one location to the other people, uh, to the other location. So uh, I ended up reaching out to various folks within the community, asked them for some sponsorship. So I ended up reaching out to, uh, to EMC, ended up ran, reaching out to, to NetApp and another uh, couple of uh, companies out there. 
and we ended up creating these this massive events with you know we had buses uh, driving us between hotels uh, to close by the uh, the San Francisco bridge we had t-shirts we had drinks we had food what have you it was that was one of the craziest experiences ever and the cool thing about it is that after that you know the, the follow up years VMworld actually started organizing that event uh, themselves but it's uh, yeah that was one of those things that you know it started out with just a random community thing and ends up being this 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 massive uh, event well not huge huge but you know in our case 200 plus people running through San Francisco it's pretty crazy to get anybody out of bed after being at the world for a couple of days to go for a run right is, is yeah. in the morning, that's for sure um so along the way right we, we we all make mistakes and we all have to kind of own up to those mistakes and kind of learn from them but is there any mistake that you did that you that gave you the greatest lesson well i made countless of mistakes i think everyone the, 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 i mean everyone makes countless of mistakes and agree that it is uh it's an opportunity to learn, right? I think probably one of the biggest mistakes uh, that I make made is that I didn't start early on with things like public speaking. Speaking. Um, it's 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 kind of weird if you look at what my role is today. Um, I do a lot of public speaking today, but I always used to be terrified of public speaking. Um, I, I would get extremely nervous. I would get physically sick. Uh, even when I was young, right, when I was 14, 15, I would never do any form of public speaking, not even in front of my own classmates with, you know, 20 people. I just, I would get physically sick. I wouldn't go to school. And that is something that I probably should have forced myself uh, doing, starting to do much earlier uh, on in my career, because that would have helped with a lot of things. It's, uh, for me, it was extremely difficult if I was in a meeting with 20, 30 people and I knew something that they were saying was either incorrect or, mm -hmm. you know, it's um, it wouldn't work for customers. I could barely speak up. I, I could barely raise my hand, right? With, with, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, I would be okay. Two, three people, I would be okay. More than five, yeah, not so much. So that is something that I, I definitely regret. But even a bigger mistake that I made is that um, when I joined VMware, and it also goes back to public speaking, uh, after a year or so, one of the engineers, one of the vSphere HA engineers reached out to me and he asked me if I wanted to um, help him create a VMworld session because I had a lot of experience in the field. So I said, you know what, I will help you out. I helped him out developing the slide deck. And then after we've developed the slide deck, he said, you know what, do you want to present the slide deck with me? And I said, nope, not happening. He said, oh, come <laughs> on, dude. Well, why not? I said, well, I'm terrified of public speaking. I'm not going to go up in front of a group of 50, 60 people. I'm not doing it. He said, ah, no worry. You know, I'm going to be up there as well, blah, blah, this and that. I said, no, I'm not, not, not doing it. After a few weeks of just going back and forth, I ended up thinking about it. And I said, you know what? I probably should do it. Hmm. How many people do you think will show up? He said, well, last year we had 100 something, maybe 120, 130, whatever it is. I'm like, oh, man, that's a lot of people. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to do that. He's like, well, you know what? I'm going to be there as well. Like I said, if whatever reason doesn't work out, I'm going to be next to you. I can always pick up where you stop. That's no problem. People will notice. So we'll figure something out. I said, okay, okay I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm just going to see what happens. And I'm just going to rehearse it a couple of times. I should be okay. A few weeks before the event, uh, he phones me up and says, you know what? Something has happened. Uh, there's a big release coming up, as you know. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a long list of bugs and I'm not allowed to go with, to VMworld. So you need to present this whole session by yourself. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. He said, but don't worry. Uh, you know the material inside out. You will kill it. It's not going to be a problem. Like, dude, I have never done this before. So <laughs> I'm for sure not going to kill it, but okay, we'll see what happens. So he emails the VML team. The email the VML team uh, says, "Okay, we'll uh, register the, the the name to Duncan." So I became the primary speaker on the session, and they said, "You know, Duncan, you can now log into the backend system and actually see how many people signed up." So I logged into the backend system, and I figured that the number would say 100, 120, 130, but it actually ended up saying 500 something. <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh my god!" But it was still three weeks to go. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately for me, uh, you know, depends on how you look at it. 
it ended up being a full room. So it was 700 something people that signed up for the first session. And then they repeated it with another four or 500 uh, uh, people. <laughs> and I had to go there uh, up by myself. So that was probably one of the worst experience uh, experiences in my life. And no, you know, I know everyone wants to hear, you know, that great ending. Yes, I went up on stage. I killed it. I nailed it. People started cheering and clapping. No, it was nothing like that. <laughs> I went up on stage and I was terrified for 60 minutes. For yeah. 60 minutes straight, I could hear this little voice in the back of my head saying, just walk out of the room. No one will notice. <laughs> just walk away. You can still walk away. Just go out. Did you find that when you were, when you went up and you stood by the podium, right, and you got the microphone and everything there and, and your legs kind of like shaking a little bit and your hands are a little bit sweaty and you're kind of thinking, well, uh, yeah, so what's the next slide? Oh, hell, what do I do now? And it, I think when I did my first public speaking events, I, I'm from a, a very performing entertainment family. My brother's a musician. My dad sings yeah. a lot and likes to do all that kind of thing. And then, but I don't. But one of the things that when I was, went for my first like reseller business, um, one of the guys there that's now the CTO goes, do, do you want to do a presentation with me? I was like, no, not, not a chance. And he was like, why not? You, you, you're fine. You know all the content. You'll be fine. I was like, yeah, not a chance. Not a chance. It's not me. I don't want to be on stage. I don't want to be talking to people. I don't want to do this, that, and the other. Um, I'm happy just to be, I'll do the, I'll do the demo, right? I'll sit in the corner and I'll yep. run through the demo and you can talk people through it. I'm happy to do that. Um, and I didn't do it for years. Like literally, I, I would go and implement things. I'd do customer meetings with tables full of people or whatever, but I wouldn't do a public event where I'm stood in front of 10, 50, 100 people. And then I got an opportunity to do a, a presentation for Citrix at the time. Um, and I went then, and again, I got told, similar to yourself, it'll be 50, 100 people maximum. And then walked in, there was like three, 400 people. So it was a little bit nerve wracking, but I was lucky I had someone with me. So it helped. But then a few years later, I kind of thought, well, why don't I start doing some of the community events, like the VMUGs and the Citrix user groups and all the various other things that, that I've done over the years. And I started to think, well, most of the time, the people in the audience are just general people like me anyway. Yep. They're not judging you. They're just here to, to hear what experience you've had and how they can learn from it. They're not going to throw rotten tomatoes at you or anything like that. And if anything, the only people that are going to heckle you and have a bit of a joke are the people that you generally know quite well that are trying to wind you up anyway. Um, so it can quite well. I remember one, one year where I, I got told by an account manager in the organization that this, this customer of ours is running a, a conference for all the umbrella companies that, that report into them. I was like, all oh, right, okay. Because they want us to do a presentation on how we can help them with um, e-discovery and GDPR compliance and things like that. Well, I was like, all right, fantastic. That's a topic that I know really well. <laughs> um, so I was like, sure, let's, let's go and do it. And he told me it was gonna be a small conference, right? So I turn up in, in Amsterdam and um, I go into this building and then I'm getting all mic'd up and everything. I was like, all right, cool. It seemed quite a small building. But then I can hear like music playing and whatever else. And then all of a sudden I walk out through this curtain and it's an auditorium. Oh yeah, yeah, so, I've been there. 1,500, 2,000 people staring at me. And I'm like, oh my dear God. <laughs> and then all, all that I remember the guy saying to me is, is, don't stand in one spot, work the stage and walk down the middle. Because you even have the ramp down the middle so you can go right to the middle. Yep. Of the room. People, I was like, now, now I'm lost. <laughs> so it was a great experience. I think a lot of the time you have to be thrown into those things to really kind of grasp it and just get to terms with that actually there's nothing to be afraid of. I'm just going to give it a go. Well, there's a lot to be afraid of, to be honest. It's, um, <laughs> I mean, chances of you just bombing it are, are quite significant, of course, especially when you've never done, never done it before. And that's, that's, that's why I say it was one of the biggest mistakes that I made. As you mentioned, the community events, the community events are the easiest way to start doing this, right? And especially when you go to the local chapters, and I've been at almost every single local chapter in Europe, they typically have, you know, anywhere between, you know, the, the, the smallest will have 25 people, the largest may have 100, 150 people, but if you're smart and you pick the right one and they schedule you, you know, multiple sessions at the same time slot, you may end up with 20, 30, 40 people. And that's a great way to start. And that's what I should have done as well. That was the biggest mistake that I made. I should have not started at VMO because you will end up with seven, 800 people in the room. Well, you've never done this before. And of course, you're going to be extremely nervous. Of course, you don't realize that the people aren't there to judge you. They are there for the content. Of yeah. course, you don't realize yet that the people don't know what you're going to talk about. That's the biggest mistake that I, I, I made. 
<laughs> because when I've got something on the first slide or on the second slide, I started getting more nervous. Well, you know, someone in the audience doesn't know what I'm going to talk about. Those eight bullet points are just a reference for me, right? I can either talk about them or I may not talk about them. And I can go to the next slide and maybe I can come back to the content that was on the previous slide while I'm just talking through it. But that's all of the stuff that you learn while you do it. And that is something that I typically recommend people is when you want to get better at public speaking, when you're extremely nervous, you know, literally terrified of public speaking, start off extremely small. And when it doesn't go well, which, you know, it didn't go well for me, just do it again, right? And then the next time, it's probably also not going to go well. It may go a bit better, but it's not going to go great. So the next thing you do is you do it again. And you just keep on doing it until you get better. Thing, isn't the worst thing that people can do is go and watch the likes of Pat Gelsinger and Steve Jobs and the way that they promote themselves on stage, right? Because that's not the same thing oh, that no. we should be doing on stage. <laughs> yeah, and the, the other thing as well, that, so this, that, this is a very good point, right? If you look at someone like Pat Gelsinger, when he does a keynote, right? He has these big monitors in front of him. Mm. The majority of his talking lines are all scripted. That is reality, right? All of those major keynotes, 90% or 85%, it's all scripted. They've thought about that, that their whole, you know, talk track, it's literally in front of them, of the screen, what is going to come next, 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 next. In our case, you'll have the slide as a backup, but that's it. But what you say, you know, is a good point because I still recall first couple of times I saw people up on stage, someone like Chad Sackett, for instance, or Vaughn Stewart, right? Who works for Pew Stories these days, but back in the day at NetApp. When I saw Chad talking about Dell EM or EMC stuff, and I saw Vaughn talking about NetApp, they were just so comfortable up on stage, right? And you figure, you know what? If they can do it, I could do it as well. But what a lot of people don't realize is the amount of time that these guys have had already spent, not only rehearsing that material, but at that point in time, when you see them, they've probably already presented the same deck 50 times. So he knows inside out what is, what is going to happen with every single click. He knows inside out which story works, which story doesn't work, which joke to make, which joke he probably shouldn't be making again, right? He's <laughs> gone through that whole, they've gone through the whole motion. So it is only something you can get better at by doing it over and over and over again. That's yeah. the only way you can get better at it. Yeah, and if we were going to give someone some tips, right, just like starting out in the industry and doing these kind of things, what, what top three tips would you give them? Well, especially when it comes to, you know, things like, like public speaking or uh, trying to move towards a role which is not in the field. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, when they end up working for a company like VMware, they join as a field engineer. So pre-sales or uh, a consultancy or a technical account manager, whatever it is. But the key things, the key thing for me, at least in, in my opinion is, is if you want to move towards a more corporate role, like being part of technical marketing or whatever it ends up being, the first thing, which I think is, is key, is becoming a subject matter expert on something. Mm. That something probably shouldn't be, you know, this big. It shouldn't be just vMotion <laughs> or, you know, container technology or just Docker containers, for instance. No, you should probably get something that is slightly bigger. So if you want to be, you know, subject matter expert, be the subject matter expert on you know, Kubernetes and everything that sits underneath, be the subject matter on vSphere, but pick that particular area. So storage and availability. When you've picked that area, make sure that people, other people also know that you're that subject matter expert, because if people don't know who you are and what you know and what, how you can help them, why would they reach out to you, right? That is something that is extremely cru crucial. And then the other thing is building a network. I recently wrote a little, uh, LinkedIn post about this subject uh, by coincidence. And I think building a network is just as, as important. I've had this conversation so, conversation so many times uh, with people that I mentor within the company and externally as well. And the typical question that I always get is, you know, you know, seem to know a lot, of, a, a lot of people, maybe you can help me meeting him or her or so-and-so, whatever, whoever it ends up uh, uh, being, or maybe you can give me your list of contacts, but 
me providing you a list of contacts is not going to give you a network, yeah. right? It's going to give you a list of contacts. It doesn't necessarily mean that they would like to help you when you reach out to them. So when I talk about building a network, it's about establishing relationships. When you reach out to someone, whether that's a developer, whether it's a product manager, right? Make sure to also regularly give back. And with giving back, I mean, right? Don't always ask them for stuff, but also, you know, give them feedback. That is one of the things that I've done, you know, every single, with every single person, probably not every single person, but most people that I've reached out to within VMware, most of the engineers, most of the product managers, if I'm asking them for something, you know, the next time I get feedback from a customer, I'll make sure I'll reach out to the engineer and to the product manager as well, so that they have the information that they need to improve the product. And that is something that people will always appreciate. And that is how you, you know, start creating these, these relationships with, with custom or with your network, people in your network. That is the only way you can start building that, that network. And then as soon as you have that network and people know what you do, then at some point in time, career opportunities are going to pop up yeah. that, you know, it, it, it is not, of course, it's not going to happen for every single person, but in the majority of cases, mm-hmm. if you look at every single person that I've worked with, they've all went through the same motion, right? Whether it's Frank Deneman, William Lamb, Alan Renouf, Cormac Hogan, uh, Jed Elzine, uh, Amanda Blevins, every single person, every single one of them, they all started out, you know, as a senior consultant, technical account manager, whatever it was within VMware. They started focusing on something. They started to get the name out there, started reaching out to people, started building out the network. And through that network, they started landing additional career opportunities. That's the only way, in my opinion, that you know, when you're a person like us, with that meaning someone who's field-facing, mm-hmm. consultant, whatever it ends up being, and you're not located in Palo Alto, to make a name for yourself and you know, get your name out there because it's extremely difficult, right? When you're not in the same office, that is the only way that you know people will, will remember you. Yeah, and, and I agree. And I always I always signed up to Amanda's sessions, right? The whole happiness in your career pieces and dealing with um, challenges and all that kind of stuff. They're kind of the non-technical tracks that she runs at VMworld. Because I think there's a lot of people that oversee and overlook the value in that kind of stuff, right? And they focus sometimes a little bit too much on the technology and then leave their emotional health and everything else to the side and not really realizing that they're burning the candle at both ends rather than focusing on self-awareness and all that kind of stuff. So I think anybody that has access to the VMworld content, I'd strongly go and watch Amanda's session. It's brilliant. Um, so we think about the industry, we kind of touched on the areas. And I think obviously one of the biggest areas that's, that's changed since we started is the whole virtualization space, right? And how it's changed data centers from racks and racks and racks and racks to small racks, <laughs> ultimately. Um, if we think about the current pandemic that we're in and the situation of, of, that a lot of people are stuck under at this moment in time, obviously technology is enabling a lot of people to work at this moment in time from home and from anywhere and all those kind of things. But there's a lot of positive and negatives that have come out of this situation. And obviously I spoke to a lot of customers and I'm sure you have as well. What, what are the positives that you're seeing off this and, and maybe a negative as well? Well, I mean, that, that's a, first of all, that's a great question. And um, it is funny because if I look at it just before we discuss the customer aspect, if I look at it from me, my, my personal point of view, right? I've been working from, uh, from home uh, for the past 12 years. Since I joined VMware, I've never really went to the office. Well, the first couple of weeks when I joined VMware, but after that, I've always worked from home because it was simply too far. Uh, I was too far from the office itself to drive back and forth every single day. And especially now that I've, that I've been part of a business unit for multiple years, the people in Palo Alto never really understood what it's like to be remote. And this pandemic made them realize how freaking hard our position has been for the past five, six years. I think it's six years ago that I joined the business unit. No one realized how hard it was. But now that everyone is remote, you know, we all have the same playing field. And now people are like, oh, man, it's very difficult to keep in touch with people and, yeah. you know, and all these different time zones and, you know, scheduling meetings. And it's, it's, it's just a challenge and, you know, working from home, having kids and, and what have you. It's, it's not easy. You said, well, I've been telling you that, you guys that for six years, right? So, <laughs> so that is something that is great. 
The other thing, of course, is that for me, no travel. Uh, I think that is fantastic. I think that goes for a lot of people uh, in the industry in general, especially people working for a larger technology company. It's probably the same for you. A lot of the consultants, you know, always away from home. Uh, it was always impossible to do things remote. And uh, now all of a sudden, right? Uh, I was, it, it was never possible for me to do a session with this, you know, Turkish customer or this, this customer in Dubai or Abu Dhabi remotely because, you know, it doesn't work with their culture or whatever it is. You need to be in the room and blah, blah, this and that. That's the, the, the same argument from every single salesperson. But now all of a sudden, it's all okay. Right? <laughs> it's all possible. Like, so there's a couple of things happening. First of all, I think, you know, a lot of companies and people are realizing that you don't necessarily need to travel somewhere to have a good conversation with someone, right? This just works as fine. When you have, make sure that you run it in full screen and you can focus and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or you know one-to-many, whatever it ends up being, it works great. Not just from a conversation perspective, even from a work perspective, because you can access the majority of things that you need remotely. The other thing, what I've noticed with a lot of customers on top of that, is that the timelines that they had for introducing new technology those timelines exactly have been accelerated to the extreme, right? In some cases, people were like, oh, we need to introduce this new app or whatever it is in the upcoming three years. They went back from three years to 12 months or maybe even six months, whatever it ended up uh, being, primarily because now people weren't sitting in the same building anymore, but they were scattered all throughout the, uh, the, the, the country and they needed to have access to certain systems. And that new application was supposed to enable that. So a lot of those timelines have been uh, ac ac accelerated to the extreme, which for us as technologists is, is a great thing because it means that we get to sell a lot of, you know, cool technology that in the past people were like, oh, you know, that, that is something that may happen in the future or may not. And now they know it needs to happen rather there's sooner or later. There's a value right to process, right? And to, to red tape, right? Which is ultimately what slows a lot of these things down. But if we think about, I don't know who said it, but someone said the other week, there's been, what, three years worth of transformation in the space of eight, nine months. Oh, yeah. People have had to do it. So it's like, well, if that is the situation now, once this pandemic has finally done one and disappeared and we're back to normal, hopefully, that's, I, I just really hope that doesn't go back to being all yeah. the red tape that makes projects three years long again, because it's not, it's obviously not needed. Yes, I get the rules is compliance and governance and process to follow and project management frameworks and all that kind of stuff. But surely if you've managed to do it successfully now, tweak it a bit more and maybe make it like a eight, nine, 10 month project rather than three years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what would be interesting is to see if people are actually going to do a postmortem and try to figure out for those projects that shrunk from three years down back to eight months or nine months, whatever it ended up being, what they ended up skipping right? Why did it only take eight or nine months instead of the three years that you projected? Did you leave out, you know, anything with regards to uh, compliance and regulations? Did you skip certain parts of the availability, uh, resiliency testing? Or did you simply crunch the timelines? And were you, did you end up being more realistic about the time that it should have been taken? Because this is one of the things that a lot of people tend to forget, right? When you sit down with an engineering team, whether those are developers, whether they are consultants or, you know, your own system administrators, when you give them two weeks to build a particular system, it's going to take them two weeks, yeah. right? When you give those same people, instead of those 10 working days, eight working days or seven working days, they will probably make sure they can get it done in seven or eight days, right? So I think that is something that is crucial that people will need to do at the end of this when we go back to normal or when they you know, can probably properly breed again. Because, I mean, people have been extremely busy for the past eight, nine months. That is something that I think we need to realize as well. But when we go back to what may be you know, normal, it's probably not ever going to back to normal, normal, but close to normal. Hopefully people will sit down and try to figure out, okay, which parts did we skip? Do, you, do we actually need that six weeks long change process, right? Where we have these handovers that take two, three days simply to get a, you know, networking port opened up, you know, <laughs> exactly. A lot of those things are typically not needed. Can we automate a lot of those aspects? And a lot of cases, that is what they've done in the last nine months. They've automated a lot of the aspects that 
in the past needed to do uh, needed to happen manually for whatever uh, ever reason. I think so it's hope... that thing around technical debt, right? So what technical debt is going to come out the back of this situation? But I think for technologies, I think is there's an element that where we should be happy to accept a, a, a certain amount of technical debt and a little bit of mop up afterwards. Because even if you did that, yeah. it would be a much shorter time frame than the three year or whatever it is that your plan was originally. And the other thing is as well, I think what a lot of people have skipped is that, um, I mean, when you're an architect and you have you know 16 weeks to some, think about something, you end up over-engineering things. Mm -hmm. So what also a lot of people ended up doing is, you know, there were a lot of companies that all of a sudden had to implement some form of, you know, virtual desktop, VDI, and use a computing solution over the past six to nine months, right? That typically would take them two years. Think about the storage system, think about, you know, the computer system. Then they had those images, all of the applications. Some applications would be available via the web. Some applications wouldn't be available via the, via the web. How can I expose those uh, users to the applications? How can I make sure that the data is backed up and what have you? What they now have simply done is, okay, let's look at the market, which solutions are out there, which can I use, and how long will it take me to implement those? And is it good enough for customers or not, for our customers, for our end users to use? So they skipped a lot of those different hoops they would normally need to jump through and simply went for the simplest solution that they could implement in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Instead of validating those 20 different solutions, doing a proof of concept for all of those different and vendors, they're like, you know what, just buy this and get it done. Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting all the, and it's literally it's analyzing every single vendor product and then getting all the pros and cons from each of those vendors and then tries to defunct the vendor that was in previously. And, all, and then you get, get, customers get really confused on that stuff, right? And that's where, the reseller space and the partner world coming to try and help that a little bit, um, but it's still extremely difficult. And I see a lot of people do a lot of reviewing and contemplating rather than just doing yep. that. And, and the funny thing is that, now that you mentioned that, typically when it comes to this, this, this whole situation in terms of deciding which product will make it, right? There are only two things that truly matter. Literally only two things. First of all, that's typically the technical guy who has a preference from a technical perspective, right? And if you have 20 products or if you have five products, there is one product that stands out to him that he would like to use. He or she would like to use, I should probably say. And then there's the budget aspect, right? His or her manager will probably have a preference in terms of the total amount of cost. And he has a pro he probably or she has a relationship with a vendor. Mm -hmm. And between the two of those, they will, they will need to figure out what they would like to use. Right. There's only two things that, 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 that really matter. And typically there are two products or two vendors that stand out. Although they may have six listed, yeah. there are typically only two that really, you know. Make it through to the final stages. Exactly. So why would you bother, you know, spending time testing those four uh, other solutions when you know that from a budget perspective or from a vendor preference standpoint, they're probably not going to make it anyway. It's no. I think a lot of those stages have been skipped over the past six to nine months. Yeah, that's, that's definite. And talking about like technologies, right? Is, is there any technology that are really taking your interest at the moment? Uh, well, you've already mentioned the smart NIC technology. I think the smart NIC technology is extremely interesting, uh, not where it stands right now. I mean, if you look at the smart NIC technology right now, yeah, you can offload some of the, uh, the networking services, but there is not enough uh, compute power on the majority of smart NICs out there today to run uh, a larger portion of the um, of the, uh, the the virtualization slash storage slash networking stack. However, uh, there are new families and uh, new versions of current families being released in the near future that will allow us uh, to start offloading a lot of the services. And it's not necessarily the offloading of the services that interests me it's the different use cases that customers uh, will come up with and that the various engineering teams will, 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 will come up with, right? If you, for instance, look at Amazon, uh, Amazon has this, uh, this, this solution that they call Nitro and they offload their full, uh, basically their, their full virtualization stack to that Nitro uh, uh, card. That is truly unique for their uh, stack. And it's something that actually fits their model extremely well because it allows them to sell all of the uh, resources that are part of the host to their customers. So it's uh, from a, a cost perspective, it's a really good operating model. But of course that doesn't necessarily apply to the enterprise world. So from an enterprise perspective, it will be really interesting to see 
what kind of use cases they have for these types of solutions and whether they are in the storage space or in the networking space, or maybe it's something completely different. I think that is probably going to be extremely interesting to see what happens there because it's one of those situations where you have a new piece of hardware, but you're still trying to figure out, you know, everything it's, it, it, it could potentially solve. We know some of the problems that it solves, but there are probably a lot of other problems out there that we haven't figured out yet that this new solution can solve. And I think that is something that is, it's just always intriguing to see, you know, what pops up in those, in those situations. Yeah, and I think for me, if I think about that whole smart mic play and the offloading capability to those areas, I think that's telcos is the number one area for that, right? With what they can do at the edge moving forward we're on their telephone masks and 5g connected yep. and all that kind of stuff there's going to be a massive play there on how they can maybe provide offload functionality for people that are willing to pay for additional revenue streams potentially so let's just say that you're releasing a new game for argument's sake how can you put a partition of that game at the edge or at the telephone mast and yep. pay that provider a a free for making your game better than everybody else's right or whatever it might be there's lots of options there that i think are available and i think the next 12 months of coming up with those concepts and ideas is going to be very, very interesting. I think, I think VMworld next year will be a very interesting conversation to see what people have managed to actually achieve with it. Yeah, for sure. And this is also why I thought personally that the, um, the acquisitions that NVIDIA did over the last 12 months with Mellanox and with uh, ARM mm -hmm. are very intriguing. If you combine that with their GPU technology, they now all of a sudden not only have a full data center solution, but in the edge space as well, they can offer a really cool solution. So that is, you know, something that really excites me. And especially knowing that VMware is going to involve in that, that whole strategic effort is, 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 is amazing. Yeah. And do you think there's any day-to-day -day technology that you use that's unsung that people should be aware of? So my, my example of this is like things like Microsoft Flow, right? Where you can automate parts of your day and people are, not even aware they've got access to it, right? Is there any kind of unsung heroes that you that you use that is worth telling everyone about? Well, oh, that's a great question. It's, I mean, I think I basically use the majority of tools that are, that a lot of people and end up up uh, using. There's nothing really specific. Uh, one of the things that I do use a lot, um, but this is something that a lot of people end up doing is uh, I use a lot of the uh, the to do uh, lists simply as a reminder in terms of, you know, what I was planning on, on doing or not. It's um, for whatever reason, you know, I can remember crazy details in terms of what a hypervisor does or doesn't do or how TPS works or DRS or HA, whatever it is. But when my wife asks me <laughs> to do this, this little chore, it's, I, I tend to forget it. So I, I use a lot of the uh, to-do uh, list for those, uh, those types of uh of things and you know other than that i don't have any particular types of technologies that i tend to use a lot that a lot you know people don't use when i'm talking about technologies i'm talking about you know things something that relates to work yeah. one of the things that i do want to mention which has got absolutely nothing to do with technology that i've started doing during the pandemic is uh, stretching uh, my muscles it sounds crazy uh, but I've been doing all, all types of sports for the past, uh, you know, 40 plus years, ranging from football to running to uh, weightlifting. And I started Taekwondo as well uh, three years ago. Uh, but one of the things that I never really done well was stretching. Yeah, I did stretching after, uh, after working out. Uh, but something that I've been doing uh, since the pandemic, six days a week, 30 minutes, in the evening is is stretching and it is crazy what it does for your for your body so uh, you know i don't want to talk about about tools yeah. if you want to spend you know some useful time every evening go watch some uh, stretching routines on, on youtube and do that every 30 minutes if you even if you don't do taekwondo whatever it is you will notice that just sitting walking everything just gets easier yeah and i'd agree with that i've been doing some, i've been doing um cosmic yoga with my son right and things like that and it's all stretching and things along those lines and i think um we think about animals right and stuff like dogs cats what do they do as soon as they get out of their little beds and things they stretch as soon as they, yep. stand, they stretch. as soon as they go do something they stretch whereas we sit in these chairs all day and then we get up and go and do a sport and whatever else and our warm-up is ultimately walking to the car and then driving to the football pitch yeah for sure 
it's not it's not safe <laughs> definitely not so if we um move on to some some lightning round questions right so quick snappy answers last technology purchase oh that was probably a uh, handheld hand handheld game console okay uh your biggest inspiration That is a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's. I'm, I'm not even. I'm not not sure to be honest. It's not like I have a single person that I really admire. Um, there, there are a bunch of people that I think just do things extremely uh, well. Like I've already mentioned, someone like Chet Sackett in terms of public speaking. Um, you know, but I also you know admire you know top athletes. You know that are just great at what they do, not because they are great at what they do, but what they had to do in order to, to, to become great. That is something that I really admire, you know, whether it's a top football player, whether it's top MMA fighter, boxer, whatever ends up doing, all the work that they've done to get there is uh, something that I truly admire because you know it's something that a lot of people don't realize. They think that people get are, are just born you know, that way, which in some cases they do have those skills, but it still requires an extreme amount of hard work. And that is something that I, I truly admire. So not necessarily a single person, but the work that people put in. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I'm a big will strongest man fan, right? So I like the whole kind of concept of pushing your, bound, your, your body to the boundaries and the limits and what the things those guys go through to get there is just unbelievable. Yeah, um, that's, that's definitely uh, ex extreme. <laughs> yeah, definitely extreme. Um, what does work-life balance mean to you? Um, well, for me, uh, it definitely means it, 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 at this point in time, for me, it's, it means, you know, spending more time or as much time as I can uh, with my family and spending time with them, basically doing fun stuff. So it's, it's a, a, you know, I like the phrase work hard, uh, play hard. So I, I'm not the kind of person who likes to lean back and just see what happens. Uh, like like one of my uh, former colleagues used to say, I only have one gear, so <laughs> it's just it's always full steam ahead. Yeah, and that you know typically not only applies to my work life, but also sometimes unfortunately uh, applies to uh, my family uh, family life as well. So I, I guess I sometimes drive my family nuts because of that. <laughs> yeah, I can I can definitely I'm an all or nothing kind of person and. That, that drives my wife insane, that's, that's for sure. Um, what did you want to do when you finished school? I, I mean, I just wanted to become a sysadmin, just something with computers. Um, I didn't really have an idea around, well, you know, I knew more or less what to expect, but back then uh, when I came out of school, the world was changing extremely fast, right? Uh, majority of people were still running uh, Novel uh, Netware. Yes. We were just starting to see a minor shift towards Windows. Mm -hmm. uh, I implemented the first Windows machine. So, yeah, it was just, you know, I just wanted to work with computers. And, uh, you know, it's, I expected to be a sysadmin for the rest of my life. I didn't expect to be in this position. Uh, that is for sure. Yeah, definitely. And what would you say your favorite book is? Oh, there are, uh, a lot of books which I have really enjoyed uh, reading. Um, there are a couple of books which I think are um, good reads. Uh, there's, there's, I've just started reading Mike Tyson's uh, uh, book. Mm -hmm. That one is really interesting, mainly because of everything that happened in that person's life. That's just, it's just insane. If you want to understand why he is the way he is, right? Why he became that person. Just read the first two, three chapters. A lot of people don't 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 realize that. And in general, I like those types of books. I know a lot of people in IT like to, you know, read books about uh, information technology or yeah. Yeah, so something in the science fiction space. And I like those types of books as well. But I typically like the uh, the uh, the biographies uh, more because. It also describes the struggle that people ha people had, all of the different things that they had to overcome to get that, uh, to that particular level. Uh, one other book that I do want to mention that I recently uh, read was a book by Ben Horowitz. Uh, it, it's called uh, What You Do Is Who You Are. Mm -hmm. 
And that basically uh, discusses um, how you can create a culture within a company or within a startup and how your actions will actually reflect back to you know the people that end up working for you. So that was a very interesting uh, book. And I actually enjoyed the way that he laid it out by using different examples, historic examples, but also examples from some of the startups that uh, he worked with uh, as part of his venture capitalist uh, role. I think that was a very interesting uh, conversation or uh, discussion. Yeah, definitely really interesting. Um, what's a, the most important thing to you is? Uh, that's definitely my family. I mean, that's the, that's the number one thing. If, you're fa- if you have a family and not, your family is not first, you're doing something wrong. Family should always come first. And, you know, a lot of people, I know a lot of people spend, you know, 90, 85% of the time during the week focusing on work. But in the end, work is not your family. And although every single company will say, say the same thing, we're all family, right? At the end of the year, when the numbers are presented and we're not, the company is not hitting the right numbers, and they need to lay off people. And this has happened to me before. Your name may be, may be on the list, right? You might be that you might be that crazy uncle that no one wants. <laughs> exactly. But the the thing is fairly straightforward, right? You can't fire your kids. So, in my opinion, he negotiates way out of it. That's for sure. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the number one thing, in my opinion, is always family. Is it's, if you if you take care of your family, hopefully they will take care of you as well. Yeah. Uh, definitely. And that's no guarantee with any company you work for, no matter you know which position you're at. No one is is irreplaceable. That's that's the way I look at it. And it doesn't mean that there are good companies and bad companies to work for, right? Some <laughs> companies are actually great to work for, and some companies are not so good to work for. But yeah. again, you, no one is irreplaceable. No, your family's always there, and your family are ultimately the ones that are supporting you in doing what you're actually doing, right? So without them, you wouldn't be able to do what you're doing anyway. Um, for sure. So let's, let's some random questions here now. So your favorite song? Well, that, that, that has to be Old Yellow Bricks, right? By the Arctic Monkeys. Um, <laughs> I mean, I listen to an ex- insane amount of music and I have a lot of bands that I, I love. Bands like the Foo Fighters, Pearl Jam, and Nirvana. I listen to a lot of metal, uh, trash metal, death metal, uh, hardcore punk, uh, you name it. I, I listen to it, but you know, considering my website is called Yellow Bricks, which refer to old yellow bricks by the Arctic Monkeys. I have to say, old yellow bricks. Yeah, definitely. I've just been listening to um, uh, "Goat" by Polyphia, um, just because I play the guitar, and it just—it's just an insane song to try and learn. I'm about maybe a minute and a half into trying to learn it at the moment, and it's—it's it's tough. <laughs> That's for sure. I can imagine. Yeah, that—that that is uh, that can't be easy. <laughs> um, fill in the blank. The new normal is. Not normal. Everyone says not normal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's never going to go back. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. If you think about that for a second, right? Even the simple things like in Holland, we typically would shake someone's hand when you walk up to someone. Or in France, they keep, tip, typically give people you know, a kiss on the cheek when they meet someone, right? Whether you're a man or a woman. Yeah. Right? Stuff like that, for a lot of people, may never come back. A lot of people, at least, in the upcoming years, it may even just hesitate to do that again. It's, I'm not, you know, a hugger or, you know, a person that likes to randomly kiss people uh, myself. So I don't have a problem with it, but I can imagine that for pe- people who really, you know, appreciate, appreciate hugs and whatever it is, it's going to be very difficult. It's not going to go back to normal. I can't see that happening. No, no, I, I don't think so either. And I think, um, I think there's some pros and cons to that. That's probably one for another time. Um, What's your must-watch TV show? Ooh, that is a, a tough one because um, we watch a lot of shows. It's um, it's insane from you know from The Walking Dead yeah. to we we'll just name a random show and we are watching it uh, these, <laughs> these days. It's uh, there are so many great that that is the one thing that is is great about this lockdown uh, that we just started the lockdown again in the Netherlands is that you have a lot of time in the evenings to watch TVs uh, TV and we had a lot of shows shows to catch up to so um, oh the one thing that I do want to mention if you haven't watched it is Alone. Okay, I've not seen that one. Yeah, so Alone is not a 
regular TV show. It's a uh, it's a show where they drop an X number of people in the middle of nowhere, and they need to survive for as long as they can by themselves. So they are filming themselves for an X number of weeks, potentially days, in some cases months, and they are in this you know extreme situation. So they're out in the Arctic or you know a place where you know, food is scarce, and it's it, it's it's very intriguing. Not because, well, of course, because of the survival skills that people have, but mainly because of the social aspect. Mm. It's really interesting to see what it does to people when they're just by themselves. There's just no one there. They're filming themselves. So you see people that start talking to themselves and what have you. It's it's crazy. The worrying thing is, right, is some of those people that are now isolated at home for the next however long while we're in lockdown again, they're probably going to go through that scenario without even putting themselves in that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it is going to be close. The, the big difference, of course, is that they don't need to build their own shelter. They don't need to cook <laughs> their own food, food yeah. catch their own catch their own uh, food, figure out if, even if there is food, right? In some cases, those people, depending on where you are dropped, there's nothing there. You may be able to catch a fish every five or six days, but it's, you know, that is that it does a lot to people. Yeah, have you seen uh, there's, there's a show I think it's on there is called the Three Percent. No. Now, there's a very similar concept, right? Where there's a, this this idea that only three percent of the world can be privileged, and everyone else can't. And you go through a challenge and whatever else it might be to get into that three percent, uh, and then you basically get whatever you want. It's like heaven, the kind of scenario. Yeah, yeah. It's on Netflix. It's pretty cool. It's about three seasons in. I think the other one on on the Walking Dead, right? Um, so I've got the, the last season to watch before the new one starts. Um, but Norman Reedus, um, the guy that plays Daryl, he he did a show called Ride for anyone that rides motorbikes. That's absolutely brilliant. I've been watching that religiously now pretty much every evening. Just to, one, it makes me feel like I'm out on my motorbike experiencing new places when yep. I can't do it right now. It's definitely worth doing and watching. Uh, and final question, favorite junk food? Ooh, favorite junk food. Well, to be honest, I'm not really a big junk food fan. Um, but if it has to be junk food, it's probably going to be something like tacos. But then preferably at a food truck somewhere in uh, either Mexico or, you know, or the United States, whatever it I end up being. That is something that I really do enjoy. And also because, um, yeah, it's not healthy. Uh, but typically the food that you get at those places is is really really good compared to the regular you know mcdonald's or that kind of stuff i'm not too big into that uh, it's uh, yeah, you know tacos is definitely something that um i can eat any time of the day yeah definitely and i think um to round off right so where, where can people find you online what the website address uh, twitter handle and then we can wrap things up sure yellow-bricks.com is uh, where you can find me uh, at least from a website perspective that's where my blog is located uh, you can find me on Twitter at Duncan YB. And of course, I'm on LinkedIn as well. So feel free to connect. Yeah. And I'll put a link to your YouTube channel up here as well when I edit this out. Um, so if you sure. want to watch your videos, because you, you managed to get past the thousand subscriber marker uh, last week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I haven't really focused on the, on the number of subscribers or even pushing the channel because I simply post. I mean, YouTube, I basically use it for, for hosting my videos that I post on my blog. But I started noticing that people started following the channel. So I figured, you know, I may as well start plugging the channel as well because a lot of people seem to be interested in following it, you know, just natively on the YouTube YouTube platform, which makes sense because I do the same thing <laughs> with a lot of the people that I end up following. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think uh, if anyone has any ideas about starting a YouTube channel and thinking they can make millions at it, let me be a word of warning. 1,000 subscribers, 4,000 hours, which is 250,000 minutes of watch time before you can even monetize right so yep. to get that that's a lot of content <laughs> a lot of content and a lot of viewers so i'm not even i'm not even close to that yeah i reached the number of subscribers but reaching the number of hours per year because it's on a per year basis as well it's going to be very difficult you need to crank out a lot of content so yeah. and even that even it's, then you make peanuts right yeah it's, it's like enough for a cup of coffee for a year that's it <laughs> unless you go viral which is not something that is very likely to happen in enterprise IT, probably not. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I think we can probably call it quits. So thank you very much for your time. It's been fantastic. Awesome. Thanks for having me.